dear media representatives, sorry for certain technical delays. We are going to talk now on information on a general update on OSCSMM activity and the security situation in Ukraine. Please welcome Alex Anuhug, Deputy Chief Monitor of the OSC Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine. For those in need of interpretation, please use your headsets. Доброго дня. Дякуємо за інтерес до нашої спеціальної моніторингової місії ОБСЄ. Хочу повідомити останню інформацію про безпекову ситуацію в Україні згідно з даними наших моніторів на протязі отриманих на протязі останнього тижня. Today I will be traveling to Donetsk city with a team of my colleagues to follow up on the shelling in the city center during the past weekend. Also, I will follow up on the protest that took place this morning in front of our accommodation. During a mostly peaceful protest in front of the Park Inn Hotel in Donetsk, 30 vehicles owned by the OEC and other international organizations were damaged with spray paint. Some of that paint was sprayed on the windows of the vehicles making them temporarily unfit for our mission work. This type of vandalism is unacceptable and hinders the SMM's ability to conduct its work. We call for an investigation into this incident. Let me also tell you that yesterday I returned from the sixth round of negotiations of the Working Group on Security Issues within the Trilateral Contact Group in Minsk. It goes without saying that the fact that the dialogue between the sides is taking place is important and crucial. They were able to work constructively on an addendum to the package of measures related to the withdrawal of tanks and artillery systems below 100 mm and mortars up to and including 120 millimeters. The participants also agreed to review a new proposal by, for Shirokine introduced by the Ukrainian side. However, words need to translate into actions now on the ground. We have uh, witnessed the movement of heavy weapons away from the front lines and all sides claim they have withdrawn large numbers of weapons. Yet the OEC Special Monitoring Mission, which has been entrusted with the task of monitoring and verification, has heard, seen and reported all sides using so-called withdrawn weapons. These weapons are still killing soldiers and civilians in Donetsk and Luhansk region. As we speak, my colleagues are patrolling the security zone and visiting and revisiting areas outside the relevant withdrawal lines where some weapons are being held. I regret that they continue to experience restriction in their freedom of movement and are sometimes prevented from verifying weapons stored there. Weapons are being removed, sometimes in large numbers, and we are all too often told that they are in maintenance or use for training. This does nothing to build confidence and must stop. Whatever weapons are to be withdrawn, whatever caliber, the OEC Special Monitoring Mission needs to know where the weapons are now, where the routes the sites are using to withdraw them are, and exactly where they plan to store them. The SMM has asked for this information no fewer than four times and will need it again before we can verify what has or has not been withdrawn or what might yet be withdrawn under any additional measures. The package of measures refers to an immediate and comprehensive ceasefire 
withdrawal of all heavy weapons, and ensuring effective monitoring and verification by the SMM. These provisions are not being met in letter or in spirit. The sides need to demonstrate their commitment to deliver on their promises. They need to work in good faith with the SMM if they wish to have a verification system that builds trust and contributes to de-escalation that people on both sides of the line can see and hear for themselves. The overall situation in Donbas remained tense. Ceasefire violations persisted with the use of a lot of ordnance. The majority of fighting happened in the Donetsk region. This weekend we saw a serious worsening of the situation in Donetsk, with shelling occurring in Donetsk city center, which hasn't happened for months now, and in Avdivka. The fighting was close to escalating on Saturday evening. Sunday was relatively quiet, and on Monday, the SMM observed no single ceasefire violation at the Donetsk airport for the first time in many months. The shelling in Donetsk over the weekend caused significant damage to civilian buildings and sadly to at least one civilian fatality. The SMN continue its investigation into these incidents that occurred over the weekend. Also in the past week, the level of violence surged in the southern parts of the Donetsk region, especially in the north to north-northeast of Mariupol. The most affected areas being the vicinity of government-controlled Hranitne. The SMM followed up on reports by civilians about shelling of their settlements during night hours. For instance, we observe the aftermath of such occurrence in Krasnohorivka, in government-controlled area of the Donetsk region. Shirokine remained quiet. We didn't observe any ceasefire violation or any presence of armed individuals or civilians in the village center. However, we noted that some small arms and light weapons seen there on previous visits are no longer there. We continue to see large caliber weapons and movement of military trucks with personnel and equipped in so-called DPR and LPR as well as in government controlled areas. Among others, we saw 120 millimeter motors, multiple launch rocket systems, ammunition loaded trucks and T-64 tanks with support equipment. This indicates a varying increase of military activity in the ATO zone, which is a violation of the Minsk arrangement. Plus we see active fortification of defensive positions along the contact line. The observation was also confirmed by our unmanned aerial vehicles. As in previous weeks, they captured images of large concentration of military hardware in and around DPR-controlled Komsomolske in particular. <laughs> Speaking of our UAVs, on 17th July, flying east of Mariupol towards west over government-controlled area, our UAV experienced the worst electronic jamming to date. We assess it as high-grade military jamming and intentional. And this is the, not the only of incident that occurred, most of which, however, occur over so-called DPR-controlled territory. In fact, very early today, one of our UAV sustained serious damage during a hard landing near the Mangosh landing site. Again, preliminary information indicates the control was lost due to heavy 
jamming. Given that we experience uh, such interference in areas where large concentrations of weapons are observed, we strongly condemn what is essentially an act of censorship. As in previous weeks, the situation for civilians continued to deteriorate. People across the Donbass, and essentially those close to the contact line, are in urgent need of food, portable water, electricity, and gas. Among the worst affected locations are Marinka, Krasnohorivka, Khorlivka, and Hranitnya. We also observed that prices in so-called DPR-controlled areas are twice as high as in government-controlled Mariupol. We still see hundreds of civilian vehicles queuing to cross between government and non-government controlled areas. For example, on 20th July we saw 300 cars waiting to enter government-controlled site at the Ukrainian Armed Forces checkpoint in Volnavacha. Again, hundreds of cars at the checkpoint in Saitseve. Here, however, Médecins Sans Frontières managed first eight stations and four water supply points on the Ukrainian side. Ordinary people are facing intolerable weights and are subjected to dangerous temperatures, unexploded ordinances, and shelling. Traditionally, at the end of my briefing, I would like to update you on our mission numbers. 13 new monitors have joined us this week. Together, the number of international monitors is 516 now. With other international staff, plus 238 Ukrainian employees, we have now 817 people in total. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hook. And we have a first question. Uh, Ruslan Dinichenko, stopfake.org project. Uh, my question... Uh, Alexander, uh, my question will be about uh, uh, Saturday Donetsk Center mm -hmm. shelling. Uh, as stated in your report, uh, it was from the direction of uh, government-controlled uh, uh, towns of uh, Pisky and uh, Pervomaisky. And a lot of uh, Ukrainian and Russian mass media uh, reported that it was from exactly from these towns, from uh, positions of Ukrainian army, this shelling. So can you please clarify uh, this expression in the report? Do you have any evidence that it was shelling from uh, Pisky and Pervomaisky or, or it was just about direction? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, I would like to clarify that the uh, monitoring of the incident, what happened on the weekend, is not terminated. So we continue to do that. It is part of my uh, objective of my trip there to conclude uh, the observation of what happened. Uh, and I can confirm the report that was issued on Monday indicates the direction from where the fire comes, not uh, specifies the location. It's the direction as a result out of a crater analysis that we conducted. So you do not have any evidence that it was from, from these towns, right? What we are certain is the direction from where the shelling came, but from which location the uh, shells have been fired, uh, we have not determined and we have not confirmed. Mm -hmm. And uh, this report says it was MBT fragmentation uh, 125 millimeters shells. Uh, how sure you are about, about this? Uh, the experts uh, of our teams that uh, analyzed the uh, remembrance and the, what was left of the shelling are confident that this is the type of weapon that has been used. Uh, there were different calibers used across and this is also the reason why we are going uh, repeatedly back uh, to these areas to finalize the uh, analysis of what happened there in the various locations across the area that had been come under fire in that night. Mm -hmm. 
do you consider to uh, put any kind of clarification on your website about this? Because there is a confusion. A lot of uh, Ukrainian and Russian media were con confused about this exact expression in, in, in the report. Um, we will update if there are new findings. Uh, if the report has not been clear initially, uh, then we look into this. It is clear that we say the direction from, not from. Uh, but if that is not entirely clear, I will make sure that it is being clarified. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. If there are any more questions, please. Uh, hello, Yelena uh, Sachuk, Press TV channel. Uh, well, many um, uh, officials uh, greeted this uh, agreement on the withdrawal of uh, weapons under 100 millimeter caliber from the front line. Uh, well, or just negotiations on, on this agreement. Could you please tell us, uh, was it uh, well actually signed or it was not? Uh, the agreement uh, was um, tabled in the working group. At the end of the working group, slightly after five o'clock uh, on Tuesday in Minsk, the participants in the working group reached consensus. The paper has then been presented to the trilateral contact group, which then has decided not to sign it at this stage but decided it will be sign, signed in the coming days. So I can confirm it has not been signed during the meeting of the trilateral contact group. Okay, could you please uh, explain us what is the use of withdrawing the uh, weapons under 100 millimeter caliber if uh, you say, well, the OCE monitors observe heavy weapons, heavy artillery above 120 caliber on the front line, near the front line? It is important to note that tanks and smaller caliber weapons are not included in the Minsk arrangements, so it is important that they also need to be withdrawn. One has to see this as a complex arrangement, not a separate one, and that is also why it is an addition to the measures. It's not a separate arrangement, it's an addition to the measures already agreed, now including also the smaller caliber weapons and the tanks. Well, the weapons under 100 millimeter caliber have very limited range of operation, operating range. Uh, how this uh, their withdrawal will help to uh, calm down the situation near the front line? Yes, you have, for instance, a, a typical weapon which is the 82 millimeter mortar uh, that has a range that ranges between four and up to six, seven kilometers uh, on slightly above, depending on the model and the amendments made to the weapon. If they have been pulled back at this length, they go away and out of range, the actual firing, firing range, and that helps to calm down the situation. As the situation in Shirokine proves, if these weapons are being pulled out from the very close proximity of the two, the situation becomes quiet. Uh, the unilateral withdrawal in Shirokine by the so-called DPR uh, made that town quiet far too late, but it's evidence that when the, the sites are too close, fighting continues. If the weapons are taken to a distance where they cannot engage, then it, uh, the situation calms down. But the ultimate goal is not just, uh, of course, the withdrawal of weapons. The ultimate goal should be to stabilize the situation, to return to normality, and to bring a civilian logic uh, into the equation where now still only a military logic reigns. Ukrainian military also, uh, also says that in Shirokino uh, their positions were repeatedly attacked. Uh, and at the same time, we have the information from you, uh, well, from the OSCE and uh, Prussian separatists also say that they uh, retreated from the city. Uh, how, could, how could you explain this? Uh, we have indeed confirmed that there was uh, observations made by us that there is no armed uh, members of the DPR left in the village. The only armed formations left in the southern part of the village are Ukrainian armed forces. They have not moved from where they were also on the 2nd of July. We have not registered any incident that would have occurred from within the village towards these Ukrainian positions. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Chiesha Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question speaks to the presence of uh, drone jamming in, in and around the DNR and above Mariupol. Um, might I ask, um, and I'm sorry if this was stipulated earlier in another briefing, but when exactly did the jamming start uh, as a whole in, uh, in eastern Ukraine? And if you would be allowed to say, uh, is 
is the type of technology that's used to, tam to jam drones, is that sophisticated technology? Where might that technology have originated from in the Donbass? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I can confirm that we have jamming uh, problems ever since the deployment uh, at the end of October last year. Uh, it has increased in frequency in the past months or so where we had an increased amount of jamming. The jamming normally occurs over areas where we have seen that the sites have a huge accumulation of uh, hardware. Komsomolska is uh, one of these areas and I can also confirm that we assume that the jamming originates from military grade highly sophisticated jamming equipment. We have also confirmed in our reporting that the so-called DPR has confirmed to us that they have jamming equipment. Uh, this is uh, now also public available. Uh, it is important to note that we report where a jamming occurred, this doesn't automatically mean that the entity in control of the territory is responsible for the jamming as military grade jamming equipment reaches up to 100, 150 kilometers from the actual jamming device. Uh, so it remains to be seen and, and it will be very difficult to ev evaluate from which side the actual jamming uh, originates. Ukrainian National News Agency, Vitaly Fidel. I would like to return to Donetsk shelling, mm. just to clarify. Uh, in your report, you mentioned that craters had been caused by MBT's, uh, MBT shells. Mm. So, but you, as an expert, of course you know that MBT can fire at the range uh, to maximum three kilometers. Uh, but Ukrainian controlled areas are situated, and you mentioned in your report, mm. uh, 11 and 17 uh, kilometers uh, from Donetsk. So you mean that Ukrainian uh, battle tanks are located exactly in the city or how can you explain the logic of mentioning uh, the direction, uh, Ukrainian uh, control direction? Yeah, the uh, logic is that uh, the direction from where the shells have been fired is that direction. Um, be it uh, uh, from whatever instrument or whatever weapon been fired, this is not for the mission to conclude, it is uh, for those responsible to come either forward or allow the OEC special monitoring mission to continue its, its investigation into this incident which hasn't yet concluded. No more questions from the media, then we are going to finish the briefing. Reporting at UCMC and this will be our last briefing for today. Thank okay. you and goodbye. Thank you.